pleased to have both these gentlemen here. So again, Will Marsh and Hermant Ekpote. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be back here. Um, today we're going to not only demonstrate the live presentation of the music, but also talk about uh, the history, where it comes from, the instruments, how they're played, and so on. But I want to begin with just uh, playing a little bit to set the tone. So we're going to start with just uh, maybe four or five minutes of the music to get that vibration going before we start talking. And I'm going to begin tuning for the melody I'm going to play. Uh, I'll talk more about it, but every one of our pieces has a certain time of day that it's played at, a time of day or a season. So I've chosen to play an afternoon raga called Rag Bimpalasi, and we'll start with a little bit of Rag Bimpalasi to set the space. Thank you. 
we have a reference of what the music is like, how it's performed. And I want to talk about three main topics, um, a little bit about the history and culture, um, a bit about the instruments, and then a bit about the music and how the music is structured. And of course, this is a pretty vast subject, so I'm going to do my best to cover a little bit of each and still be able to play more for you. Now, um, one of the things to note about India, it's a very big country with many languages, many different traditions, and generally we have North India and South India as two of the main cultural uh, differences. This music is a music of North India. We call that music Hindustani. This is important when you're talking about Indian music because sometimes you'll hear about Hindustani music, and then you may hear Karnatak music. Karnatak refers to South India. Now these are different language groups um, and different styles of music. So what makes them different is that beginning around the 1300s, uh, the Persians, um, a very ancient empire of present-day Iran, they came into North India and started kind of taking political control and setting up their courts and their kingdoms. So at that time, North India mixed with Persian culture. And this mixture was very rich because India was already a very developed society with music and arts and poetry, as was Persian culture. So this, this mixture is really what gave birth to this music that we're playing now. Whereas in South India, it remained still very much the traditional music of India before any foreign um, interaction. So Carnatic music, South India. Hindustani music, North India. What makes them different? North India has the influence of the Persians, also known as the Mughals. So the Taj Mahal, Akbar the Great, these are all aspects of uh, Mughal India. So, and there are some, some key figures of that time, historically, that were well noted and documented. Um, one is Amir Khusro. Amir Khusro was a, a musician from Turkish lineage who came to India and he studied with the local Indian musicians and he was uh, of the Sufi order. Sufism is a mystical branch of Islam. So he was a, a Sufi practicer and musician and he wrote many, many songs, lots of poetry that was turned into music. And many people credit him with the invention of the tabla and the sitar. Now, this time in history wasn't so clearly documented, so we can't say definitively that sitar was invented by him or her, or it's a little bit ambiguous, but it does bring a testament to the, just the, the power of Amir Khusro as a, as a musical influence. And so just for a frame of reference, his um, lifespan was 1253 to 1325. So this is the early time of the Mughal influence and when that mixture was happening between uh, Persian culture and Indian culture and it started to intermingle. So Amir Khusro. And another important figure is Mian Thansen. Now Mian Thansen was one of the most famous musicians in the history of India. And he was a personal musician for the court of Akbar, Akbar the Great, great Mughal emperor. Um, and King Akbar had hundreds of musicians that he employed um, to perform for him and be a part of the palace life. And Tansen, there's many legends about the power of music in this time. It's not an art form that was just meant to entertain and kind of bring pleasure to people. It was also had supernatural qualities. So Tansen, he was able to change the weather his music. He could light fire with his music. Um, there was a power attributed to this music and art form and I think it's important to have a reference for this culture and so I'll tell one story. Um, Tansen is a part of the court of Akbar and the other musicians are kind of jealous of him. You know, he's the king's favorite and he's the power, he's this great musician that everybody is like, wow. And so uh, they provoked him and said, you know, 
If you're so great, why don't you light all the candles in the palace with your music? Show us that you can do that. And this is a big palace with candles lining the whole area. And he took the challenge, um, knowing that it was dangerous for his personal health, but also for the safety of the palace, that the fact that it could burst into flames and be destroyed. Um, so he decided what he would do is he would have his two daughters in a nearby room, and they would be singing the songs for the rain, the monsoon songs. And these songs can actually make it rain if sung correctly. So he had these, his two daughters singing these monsoon rags, and he, he performs the rag, and he lights the, the flames in the palaces. But these other two, um, his sister singing the monsoon rags, prevented the palace from burning down. And what happened, though, is it was so powerful, it, it caused him severe lung damage, and he got very sick after and died shortly after this. So this is just one of many, many stories about kind of the supernatural qualities of music um, with this. And one last thing about Tansen, he had a, a teacher. Tansen learned from a master musician, Swami Haridas. And Swami Haridas was a saint who lived alone in the jungle, and he sang 24-7 in praise of God, and that was his way of being. And so this is how Tansen learned, was from this man who lived in the jungle and the animals would listen to him and the weather and so this is a part of this music is this connection to nature and this quality of devotion um, and power and I think it's a very unique attribute uh, that's really an important part of, of what, what it all is about. So uh, now we have a little bit of a historical reference. Now let's talk about how has the music been passed on how, are we, how am I here today as a Westerner playing this ancient tradition? And in the music, there is what we have is called Garana. Garana. Garana means like a house or school. And so in the old days, the music was only taught to the bloodline, like an esoteric art form. You couldn't just learn it because you wanted to. It had to be in the family, and it was passed on generation to generation. Still today, we have families of decade, you know, 12 generations of musicians. How meant your family is probably many, many musician generations, right? So it's been passed on. And so this is a really important part of how the music is preserved. Um, so you would learn from your guru, guru is a word for teacher, and the training is, is very important and powerful. Your, your guru is like next to God, we say. So it's a very sacred, special relationship where um, you're receiving the training one-on-one -on -one and it's done by just sitting many, many hours. In the old days, you would live close to your guru or in the same house and he would hear your practice and it was just like a constant um, study that would last for at least 10 years. So it's uh, an art form that demands a lot of practice and time and energy. And the, the courts kind of offered a, a patronage for these musicians. So the, the courts, the kings would hire these musicians, just like in uh, Western Europe, we have Mozart and many great composers in Bach, who a lot of his great work was commissioned by the church. Same here, we have the, the courts and the kings employing the musicians and giving them house and a space so that they can teach and just be committed to the art form. So uh, now let's, let's move on to the instruments themselves. So I'll begin with the sitar. Now, let's start with the construction of it. So this bottom piece, if you wouldn't know, you may be surprised, this is actually a hollowed gourd, uh, similar to a pumpkin. So like a pumpkin, your Halloween pumpkin, think about that dried out and used as the main sound body for the instrument. So this is very light, very sensitive and light. So this is our, our sound body gourd. And then the neck piece here is uh, a type of wood called teak wood. 
and this is a heavier, more solid wood, and they connect it, and so these are the types of wood, and does so anyone want to guess how many strings I have on this instrument? That's right, or 19, one more, yeah. So 19 strings, and you can count by it. Every one of these is a peg for a string. And so we'll get to how, how do we use all of these strings is kind of the unique quality of, of sitar. So. so I have two bridges. I have this large bridge. This is my main bridge. And then I have a small bridge down here. So. I have 12 strings that are a part of these small pegs here. And the cool thing is that I don't actually strike these strings when I play. It is a phenomenon that we call a sympathetic drone string. And you see this on many types of Indian instruments. So, let's see how they work. And I wear a pick on my right hand, on my index finger. It's called uh, Mizrab. Mizrab means pick. And it fits on very tightly. It's, it's not comfortable. In the beginning, you develop a very big callus, and it's a part of the, the music. So I have my pick on. So I'm only hitting one string right now. It's, it's a little hard to see, but I have a, a string here that's my main playing string. corresponding string down here one of these, that the frequency is tuned to the same pitch so when I play it on one string the frequencies match and it, the string resonates by its own by the laws of physics so this is a really cool uh, phenomenon that we utilize on the sitar uh, we get all this sound all this extra sound <laughs> There's other stringed instruments from India, and they all utilize this, some with even more extra strings. So, and this was added um, slowly over time. The early version of sitar didn't have all of these, and it's cool to know that even now, these instruments are still changing and, and being developed. Um, for example, I have recently developed an electric sitar, where I have a direct plug that goes into the instrument and I use a wood instead of a gourd so it's easy to travel with and I use guitar tuners on the top and it's just a great so the instruments will always be changing with the times and with innovation so uh, all of these extra strings have been added to uh, to fit just the, the beauty and the aesthetic and then sitar is a fretted instrument so these are all frets here, and they're tied on by thread. So I can actually move the fret if I need a different pitch. Um, it's not a completely chromatic instrument, so let's say, Sari, I want a minor second. What I did is I slid this fret back to get the desired pitch. Now I'm bringing it back. So we, we move the frets for different compositions, different songs, and that is another cool feature. So now for actually how do we play it. The most unique part of the sitar is the fact that 
it is fretted, as I mentioned, but it becomes fretless because we bend. We bend from one fret, we bend five, six notes. And so it allows us to sing. Nisa. So I'm basically, I'm able to sing on this instrument because of the bending. So this is the real heart and soul of sitar, is how do we make it sing? And the most difficult part, because I not only have to pull the pressure, which is challenging, but the note has to be exact. There's no room for error. You can't be out of pitch. It'll, it'll destroy the mood. Your teacher will glare at you, and you just don't want to do that. So we practice slowly and methodically. One note at a time. And we strive for that perfect pitch. So this is uh, the beauty of sitar and the bending. And then with my right hand, my pick, there's a lot of rhythmic things that I can do. This is rhythmic right hand, another side that we developed. Da 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 language for how we use the right hand in the rhythm. And this is the, the basic foundation of sitar. You can see how we sit. This is the when I teach sitar and the first thing is just getting comfortable sitting with the instrument. You can't, people always ask, oh, do you need a chair? Or can you stand up? No, I would say the floor is the place. So we have to be very secure and grounded and get that balance uh, first. So that's the basic basic of sitar, now I want to let um, Mr. Hammond talk about his instrument, the tabla. Okay, this is a, this is actually, tabla has been divided into two drums. One is sharp drum, other one is bass drum. So, likewise, sitar is actually a uh, string instrument. And there are a lot of, uh, uh, means, things with Indian, Indian and Westerns are, are actually, they are trying to modify that instrument movements over the period of time. Likewise, guitar is also this guitar is also influenced by sitar. Sitar influenced by guitar also. At the same way, here, this is a percussion instrument. And there is not much room to <coughs> to for improvement. Yes, of course there's a tonal quality. That's why there are students We'll mention about the gharanas and all these things. Of course, gharana is very important. But in the percussion instrument, the texture, texture of your tonal quality. If your tone is not good, then any gharanas or any other things, what just you will be a musicologist, but not a performer. So the major thing is tonal quality has to be. That's why uh, George Harrison give name to this instrument is a speaking drum. It's a speaking drum. It's not only just, you cannot means a bang on it or it's a speaking drum. Same way here, just speak, uh, means uh, playing style. There are mainly three fingers are involved into index finger, middle and ring finger. Pinky and thumb is supportive fingers. Same here, these three fingers are mainly, you are going to play by these fingers, but here on left drum, bass drum, these two fingers, middle and ring, use together and the index is separate. So now there are, you can see that here that the, the top is divided into three circles, the black that is called shahi. Middle is Maidan, means the field. Outer circle is called Kinar or Kinar. 
age. These, the tuning purpose, this, for, this is for fine tuning purpose, that is called gajra. The, what do you call that, uh, this lace, that's called uh, wadi. And pex is called uh, gatta. The body of the tabla is a wood, that's called khol. It's an uh, Urdu word, that's called k-h-o-l, khol. And this is a ring, just tabla hold, holder. Mainly the, the instruments, the, the, the gatta, meaning gatta and gajra is for tuning purpose. Here, there are a lot of uh, levels you can play. Likewise, tin, na, Here is ghe, just only two levels, k and ghe. While here there are, there are much more things are 17 alphabets you are going to play. So there are different combinations and uh, major thing is practice. Every <laughs> the, the court musicians and just will uh, mention they used to practice 9, 9, 10, 10 hours uh, every single day. People does nowadays also, but little less because they don't have much time. So 4, 5 hours, 6 hours, they are happy with that. And olden days, they have my <laughs> time, so they used to practice a lot. Now, the major thing is playing, performing. You will see well how me and Will will play. There are major tal. Tal means, tal is a major composition. Five major tal, six sorry. Dadra, Dadra has six bit. Rupak tal has seven bits. Keherwa has nine bits. Ten bits is Jab tal. Fourteen bits is Dipchandi. And sixteen bits is Tin tal. So Tin tal is the king of the tal, where actually, and then all other tals come from it. Most of the uh, compositions are made in Tintal. So then people later on they, they fit it in Jabtal means 10, in 10 beats, on 7 beats, in 14 beats. That's an arithmetic. But uh, major Tal is Tintal, 16 beats. And just will play. So on Hemant's side of the music is what he's saying, Thal is rhythm, and what I'm uh, presenting is called Raga, which is the melodic structure. And so, you saw when we played at the beginning, there's a lot of, there's an interaction, it's like a dialogue. And so what's happening is, uh, we have chosen a rhythm cycle that I present because I've started the composition and then he hears immediately, he knows what the rhythm and the proper um, time is for it. And then what we have is the ability to go back and forth with improvisation. So when he is holding down, can you show them uh, teen talk? Yes. essentially how we go back and forth is with, with these frameworks. And one of the cool things about it is like, we, we could sit down having never met or spoken a word to each other and we could play an entire concert if we both are trained in the music. 
because the music is a language that we both, if we both understand it, we can jump right into it and into the performance of it. So that's one of the cool features of, of the music. And now I want to get the Tom Curry back. So this is giving me a drone. This is really important and what it actually is is, is a sampled recording of, a, of an instrument called the tanpura. The tanpura looks like sitar and it's also big and you play it like this. And what you do is you just get the open strings to create this drone, this resonance. And it's not a complicated instrument. Um, you don't do anything besides play open strings and create a sound. So. Traditionally, the, the performer student will be on stage playing the tampura, but this is essential to the performance because I need this to, to be able to be in tune and have a reference. With 19 strings, if the, the instrument will change with the weather in different rooms, so this gives me the constant backdrop of my main notes. Uh, so Indian music is, is much more of a modal music. We're not trying to change keys or do a, a lot like that. It's more based on melody and rhythm. And so I always like to just properly explain this instrument, the tampura, even though it's not here physically, it's, uh, it's a part of the performance. Yes. start tuning at any time they need to, even if it's in the middle of the song, or because if our instrument's not in tune, it's not at its potential. So we just tune as we need to in Indian music. It's not considered like a, a big deal if, someone, if we start tuning. still in my rag pimpalasa that I started with afternoon raga.
can see, this is an imp improvised art form. I didn't plan anything besides that I knew that it would be in seven beats, and I have one melody that I can rely on. And this is where the art form really becomes alive, is a great performer, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what direction they're going to go and how they're going to find their way back. And even sometimes you'll hear them make a mistake, but they figure out how to make the mistake come back and work again. So this is something about this music that's really beautiful, you know, similar to other improvised art forms like jazz and, um, you know, blues and uh, we, we, we create this on the spot. So you can see that here. And uh, let's talk a little bit about how the concert unfolds in the presentation. And so the way it begins is very slowly, very meditatively, and it works its way very fast and climactic. Now, if you're uh, listening to Indian music, which I encourage, uh, you may see the different names of different sections. And the first one that you would see would be called the Alap. A-L-A-P, Alap. And this is a very important part of the music. Now, the Alap, there is no time, there is no rhythmic setting. It is free time. And the purpose of the Alap is to bring out the mood of the Raga. Like I mentioned, every Raga has a time of day or a season. So, we want to slowly bring out the character and the quality of the Raga. And the alap is what we do that with in kind of a very meditative way. So traditionally in the concert, you'll have the tampura playing, and the instrumentalist or the vocalist will get tuned up and then they'll go into this alap. And it's, it's very gradual. And something I love about this music is just the slow, spacious quality of it. It, it really is, you can feel the connection to nature and kind of this Med it does. It is a form of meditation for us musicians. This is like meditating, and, uh, so it's a beautiful thing. And let me just play a couple phrases of the alap style. And in the old days, a great artist might just play alap for two hours, and that's it. And then he ends. In the old days, there was a real appreciation for the slow, slow melodic development. And now it's a little less so because. You know, we're more of a distracted culture now. We like things to be fast and in your face. Um, but in the old days, a great artist may just only play a lap and that's it. So here's a, just a little taste. This is the mood 
in the style of Alap was a slow development. Gradually I would work my way up the scale to the higher notes. later that I get up there. And then, let's get to the next section. The next section is called Jor, J-O-R. Now the Jor is where we do start to show a rhythmic pulse, but it is still only the instrumentalist. The tuba player is just hanging out on stage. He's just enjoying the meditation and just, you know, this is all happening with the instrumentalist. And so with the Jor, I introduce the pulse. Now a pulse is different than a tala or a rhythmic cycle. A rhythmic cycle is a number of beats that in sequence create a cycle, so a 16 beat, 5 beat or whatever. This is different than a pulse. A pulse is just, that's it. every 10 minutes, it's, it's a different type of art form, it's a long form. So, and when you go to an Indian concert, the first piece is usually, can be an hour long, easily. So, alap, jor, and then we come into a composition, usually a slow cycle. And so we've already kind of demonstrated some of that. And let's show them uh, jala, and we can try this a while to walk. So let's say that we've already had the alap and we've been playing some compositions together like we demonstrated. The climax is a section called the jala, and jala translates to like sparkling. So this is where, you know, we really show our speed and just finish with a run, you know. It's, it's all about going from here all the way to here over a period of time and improvising the whole time. So. Here we will be in a fast 16 beat cycle and let's see if you can follow the rhythm while we do this. Pulse. 
literally called question answer that we're going to demonstrate. Question answer. still going on, but we're taking sections of it and trading. Like in jazz, we have trading fours, where the percussionist may take 16 bars and then the piano another 16 and they go back and forth. So this is the same idea where we're trading spaces and then... Now there's one other thing I want to demonstrate, and it's an important part of the music. It's something we call tihai. Tihai. Now, Tihai is like a rhythmic cadence. It's something that is particular to Indian music. I don't see it so much in uh, Western classical or other styles. And what the Tihai is, is it's uh, a phrase that when it happens three times, the third time it comes back to beat one. So you hear it going, it becomes familiar, and then it resolves. But it's in a rhythmic way. It's not counterpoint or something it's it's a phrase that we play it three times and then on the third time it comes back to the one so we end with the tihai it has a satisfying kind of feeling to it so um, we'll do So what happened was is I played that idea three times and it comes back to the one and it, there's kind of a little tension in the middle but when it ends, it ends right on the on the beat one. So we'll play the T high together now. Sure. So T 
take it. cadence to it and so we end with this tihai. We learn many tihais, tabla players learn many complex long tihais and so this is another uh, cool part of the music that we have. So, um, I want to make sure to have a few moments if there are any questions. Um, I think we're kind of getting down. Well we have a little time but let me ask now um, if there's anything that you're curious about and would like to know more about. How did you get interested in sitar? Sitar, uh, I was exposed to it. I was exposed to it in college. Um, I had a lot of background in guitar, and I never expected to play sitar, but the music was just so interesting to me, and just the quality, the combination of improvisation, but it's also a very disciplined art form, and I just kind of love the virtuosity and, and the mood of it. And uh, my teacher, his name is Ashish Khan, um, and he is faculty at the Cal Arts where I studied. Um, he's in his late 70s now and from a very famous musical family. So his, his grandfather was the teacher of Ravi Shankar. Uh, Ravi Shankar is the most well-known musician. He collaborated with the Beatles, and he really brought Indian music, you know, on the, to the to the world. And more people know about sitar because of him than I think anyone. So it's really cool being in that family. I know all the stories, and you know, he was living with my teacher, and they were studying together. And so uh, I'm very lucky to have that kind of training because you can't learn the music without the right guidance. It will never be an art form that will be like teach yourself with these videos. It's just, it's impossible because it's so rich, detailed and complicated that you will always have to have the right teacher to learn. So, you know, there's a lot of things I can talk about today and one maybe that I'll talk a little bit more about is that quality of, we don't really use much notation. I mean, you sit with your teacher for a couple hours and you just, you memorize and soak it in. There is some notation that helps you just remember, but it's, you can't really write down. I mean, writing that down is more of a headache than just spending time and being able to memorize and, and create it your own, so. Uh, you know, I go to India now every year and I get to study more and perform and it's just amazing to see the culture there, the reverence for the teacher. It's like these guys have so much respect for the teacher and to see that is something just really beautiful. Uh, I just haven't seen as much of that in, in my own culture and, you know, it's it's a really profound relationship, you know, you learn from this master for years, who learned from his father, who learned from so on and so forth, and, you know, you'll sit in a lesson and he'll say, yeah, my grandfather taught me this when I was 10 years old, and he has this story about it, so th there's so much happening that you're not just learning music, you're, you're becoming a part of a very old culture and lineage. So that's a very long answer to a question. Um, do we have any other specific questions? Yeah. Uh, I just want to know what, you, what you're thinking of when you're uh, improvising and soloing, if it's like actual scales or chords, or if it's just whatever you're kind of like feeling. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, so I am aware of the rhythm if we're playing together I'm aware of what the rhythmic structure is and I'm trying to and so also like with the raga which I'm playing I practice a lot of scales and exercises in the raga compositions exercises so I have some patterns that I can go to like for this rag bingalasi <laughs> minutes just on over 
So when I'm improvising, I'll take something that I know and I'll start to create variations on it. And that's where the spontaneity comes in, is I'm taking something that I've played a lot, but in the moment it's coming out new because I'm, I'm just, it's a combination of what's happening in the moment, my mood, what I'm hearing from the tabla player, and what I've already learned. So it's a very unique art form because it is improvised, but we've learned so much to get to that point of improvisation. You never just get up and you can't just play a sitar recital having learned a little bit. You know, it takes that many, many years to be able to improvise in the form. So, um, you know, I still consider myself a student. I, there's never a point where you're there's a there's a lack to study because it, it is so rich. So, um, the rags that I play are the ones I've studied the most. This one I've learned a lot. I've sat with my teacher for hours and I've wrote things down and so I have that to draw from when I improvise and it's a combination of having a lot of that repertoire but then you become experienced as you perform. You, you know, you, you become better at taking one idea and going many directions with it. When you're a beginner it's hard because you're kind of you're not. You're a little restless. You know. You're, you don't have enough, anything to rely on, so you tend to jump around quicker and not be able to play as long. But as you develop your improvisational skill, you can you can create many things with with one idea. So I'm still a student of improvisation, and there's new ragas that I'm currently learning that I'm trying to bring up to the level that I have other ones. Um, but yeah, it's it's a combination. And it's still something I'm even developing now. Yeah. Yeah. I was just a question. I was wondering in India, is it is it more predominant that I'm sorry? Is it more? Um, do we have any women playing? Is there just a, is it more like a male dominated? Um, there are fantastic instrument? women musicians. Um, it it's a little more recent that they are really stepping more into the performance role, mm -hmm. um, but. Now, yeah, we have great women performers um, equally, and it's really cool to see that, yeah, there's women sitar players, women vocal, yeah, it's, it's really um, not restricted to gender in music, yeah. Yeah. Do you plan on becoming a teacher one day? Um, I do, and I, I do teach. I have students, and... Um, you know, to start from scratch, I have a lot to offer. I'm not, you know, a master musician from India, but I have learned um, very steadily from great musicians, so I do have a lot to offer, and it's really something I feel like I'm, I'm meant to carry on this tradition. You know, it's not easy to find a sitar teacher and have the time and energy to commit to it, so the students that I do have, I feel very good that I'm giving them good guidance and information that I have gotten. And so it's a part of, um, a big part of it for me is carrying on the tradition and passing it on. Yeah, so I will never come to a point where I'm, you know, I'm a master and I'll teach, but I will humbly offer what I, what I know. So, yeah. If you're interested in lessons, you can contact me. Yeah. I do. I do. Um, yeah, more than the music, um, Indian culture, respect for elders is something I've really appreciated. Um, and also a quality of being less restricted with time and letting things develop more spontaneously. Um, when I'm in India, things are just a little more fluid. It's not so you know, you, you may learn one rag from your teacher and it's a totally different lesson one day from the next. There's a quality of, it's like you're open to bringing down a mood is more important than 
than having like a sheet of paper of music that has to be played perfect. There's a quality of, um, yeah, and I've taken that a lot from India, and there's a devotion to it. It's always very respectful, and it's not about showing off or like playing a show. It's about bringing an experience of me as an artist. I am, I'm sharing with you my devotion of the music, and you get to appreciate and, and feel it as much as I do. So in this music, it's not about like, it's not even about like, I wrote this song, check it out. It's about, okay, this melody's been played for thousands of years, and I'm gonna bring it to life in this moment so we can all experience it. And that's something that I really love and that attracts me to this art form. What's yeah. the price range of a sitar? Sitar? Um, from six, seven hundred to a few thousand. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a very good sitar for two thousand dollars. You can get like a top-notch instrument. You can get a good beginner student sitar for eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. actually brings us to the end of our time. We, uh, let's please welcome and thank you. Come on and will. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for being here. Uh, once again, we'd also like to thank the Instructionally Related Activities Funds. And for people in my classes, you, we have a survey that you can find on Canvas to fill out. And as usual, your feedback will go to the funding committee and will allow us to keep bringing these concerts to campus. So I hope you enjoyed this experience. It was a very special thing to experience this music in person. So we're very grateful, grateful to our guests today. Thank you very much. <laughs>